So as we, we have uh, already mentioned last time, today we start by discussing the realistic hydrogen atom. That's going to be the first uh, new subject in this course because I assume everybody has taken the non time independent perturbation theory from the first course. So I'll just review the basic principles or the lessons we extract from that formalism and I will use them instead of going through and deriving all the principles of the time independent perturbation theory, particularly the degenerate case. So let me review the basic uh, results of the degenerate perturbation theory. And I will state them as, a, as a, I will just give a few statements about it. Basic states, statements on time independent perturbation theory, but I, I'm not going to go through all, the, all, all of it in detail. I will just talk about the degenerate case because that is the, essentially all the physical problems are uh, degenerate, degenerate case. So if we have a physical system described by a Hamiltonian H, which could be decomposed into two pieces which we call the known and large part, known and large. We have explained last time, I guess, what we mean by large and small, these are because these are operators. Largeness or smallness should be worked out in a given basis and that basis is the complete orthonormal basis of this Hamiltonian itself. Therefore, you have to understand this largeness and smallness in that context. This is this, a small part which we call perturbation. We identify a small coupling constant by writing H1 as G V. That G really should be sort of, it should serve the purpose of expanding certain states and operators. So that is the starting principle of this algorithm, split the Hamilton into two pieces. The first one is to be known, that's important. And then in the degenerate case, we write the an eigenvalue problem of the H0 as Ni En0 Ni. Notice that there is an additional index associated with the number of states which measures, which reflects the multiplicity. That is, there are many states and single level. Notice that this energy doesn't carry any additional index because there is a single level for each and there are many states, thus N and I label there. That is the degeneracy. Notice that degeneracy is a property associated with the known part. And so what you're really doing by working this perturbation theory is to see the effect of this H1 through the corrections. It's going to lead to the energy eigen values and energy eigen states of this one. And you also investigate the phase of the degeneracy, what happens to the degenerate levels in a sense. So I can now say, summarize the those basic statements, state, statements. The first one is that the energy corrections to first order, of course, we focus our attention on the first order corrections are the eigenvalues of the perturbation matrix or the H1 of the H1 in the degeneracy subspace. That's an important statement. 
Uh, if you don't remember it that well, please go through your notes of 547 and refresh your memory because that is a very important statement okay. of the H1 in the degeneracy subspace. The idea is the following. For given an, there, is an, uh, there are so many number of states, we will work out in detail, labeled by the I, so that forms a subspace in its own right. For each end, there is a small subspace of dimension, say, 4, 9, 16, for the hydrogen, for instance. Or, of course, depending on the very nature of the problem, the dimension of the degenerate subspace ch changes from problem to problem. So, you just work out the matrix representation of H1 in that particular degeneracy subspace and compute the eigenvalues and those eigenvalues are the first order corrections, the original energy eigenvalues EN0. That's the first statement. The second statement is, that's a very important statement, as you all remember I presume, there's a mixing at the zeroth order due to the effect of the perturbation although you may start with any one of them, that is, there are so many states associated with a single level, and the, as there is no energetics argument to distinguish between those different states of the degeneracy family, so when you turn on, of course they may split and they may shift it, but when you turn off the perturbation, when they come back, those different levels, they should, call, they should converge to a single level, but which one of the original states in that group is going, they are going to go is not decided because energy cannot decide on it. So there's a mixing. And the mixing matrix that's the zeroth order effect for the states, zeroth order effect for the eigenstates. So we talked about the eigenvalues, now we are going to talk about the eigenstates. The mixing matrix are the normalized, that normalization is important because of the normalization of the eigenvectors themselves, of the normalized Sorry, I'm not going to use that because they are unit vectors already. Are the eigen, the, the mix matrix of the order are composed of columns. That's too much detail, but that's really what it is actually. Are the columns of a unitary matrix. Unitary matrix. First of all, the mixing matrix, zeroth order effect for the eigenstates are composed of columns of a unitary matrix and each of them of them are the eigenvectors of the H1 matrix, that is the one we have already computed there, matrix corresponding to the eigenvalues computed in the first part. Well, those of you who have seen it already, this expression in plain English may mean something, but if you haven't really played with this before, this may not mean that much. So you have to really pay attention to it. There is a, a unitary matrix Cij, as we have uh, seen before, and there are columns, right, each of them. As this is a unitary matrix, all the unit vectors of this unitary matrix are unit vectors. That's an important thing for the normalization of the physics. Then how do you compute those unit vectors? 
go back to the same eigenvalue equation. Eigenvalues are the energy corrections, eigenvectors are the columns of the mixing matrix. So these are the basic lessons that we had to extract from degenerate time-independent perturbation theory. Thus, we can turn our attention to the real hydrogen atom problem and use those theorems to work it out. First of all, we have to illustrate a little bit what do we mean by realistic hydrogen atom. If we are searching for a realistic hydrogen atom, then obviously the na naive model that we have been working on, which is the Coulomb problem, should be a non-realistic or approximate one, right? It's a naive description. So we need to see what kind of additional terms that we have to modify this to make the model more realistic. That's the job. So this H0 is the Coulomb Hamiltonian, which is P squared over 2M plus, I write it in this, kinetic energy plus potential energy form. Therefore, this is the Coulomb potential energy. And as you all know very well, I, I, I have been, uh, I have already talked about at the introduction last week. Uh, this, let's uh, uh, write the solution of this uh, particular problem by expressing the energy eigenvalues that you find automatically using the Schrodinger equation, for instance. And it is minus alpha squared over 2n squared times the rest mass energy of the electrons. So not to get confused with anything else, let's put the energy lab electron label underneath. Alpha is the fine structure constant, uh, e squared over h bar c, which has the numerical value 1 over 137, and which is uh, so, sort of a very beautiful number. N is the principal quantum number, that's an important fact, and it goes from 1 to 3 all the way to infinity in principle. N equals 1, the minimum value of it. And uh, strangely enough, as I said, this problem is rather amusing. It's so nice to go through it every now and then. Strange, strangely enough, you uh, start solving this problem by identifying a set of compatible, compatible operators, which are the H0 itself, the L squared, the angular momentum operator squared, and this is the third component of the angular momentum. And it's based on the fact that this potential is spherically symmetric, so-called central potential, meaning that it is free, it is invariant under any rotations, that you can orientate your reference frames any way you like. So it is a central potential, it's invariant under rotations. So you, meaning it commutes with the any components of the angular momentum operator, you choose the third component, and then uh, using the basic commutation principles of the angular momentum algebra, you know that L squared commutes with any components of the angular momentum, so you complement that set by including that in the list. Therefore, you have three operators which all commute mutually among themselves, thus you have to have three quantum numbers to label the states. And the one associated with the L squared is labeled by L, the one associated with the LZ is M, not to, distinct, not to confuse this m, which is the magnetic quantum number with the mass of the electron. When need arises, we are going to use this extra label E. And of course, this is labeled by the principal quantum number. Therefore, you have those energy eigenvalues labeled on, containing only one of these quantum numbers. However, the states. If you want, you can label the states with the associated quantum numbers, put the zero emphasizing that it's associated with the non-perturbed part, and, or you can focus your attention on the coordinates. Please get used to my language now. That is the projection of this in the coordinates of this in the X spaces. 
But x basis shouldn't necessarily be Cartesian. We use the pole spherical polar coordinates. That is, this one is obtained by projecting this on r theta phi, right? That thus it becomes a coordinate. That is an abstract state vector in the Hilbert space. And what is the form of these? The form of these are a ra there is a radial part that is only depending on the radial variable r, and there is also an angular part. This angular part is geometrical, it is independent of the dynamics. That is, it doesn't, it is the same in, uh, for any kind of spherical potential, irregardless of the explicit form. This one. But this contains the dynamics. And it carries the two of the labels, N and L, and this carries the label YLM. Now, if we go through the analysis, now I, I have to do it, of course, just using my memory, but if you go through your notes, you're going to see the details of it. Now, if you would like to count the degeneracy, Perhaps I'm doing it for the three times, for the third time, but it's nice because you, you, it is a, the, the, the most basic examples of quantum mechanics. Thus, it doesn't hurt to repeat it. Energy is labeled by only n. So if energy is given, how many states are associated with this? Energy given means n given, right? Now, what are the possible values of the L that you, can, you, you should be considering? then L goes from 0 to N minus 1. So N is given already dictates a certain range for the L quantum numbers. And once you choose any one of these from that range, so L given and M is restricted in this interval, and there are how many possible values that N can take by when it's restricted in this interval, there are two L plus one possible values for the M. And you take this and sum over that. And once N is given, L, L can take any one of those. So you sum L from zero to N minus one, two L plus one. You use simple, simple number theory argument, simplest. As Mr. Gauss has discovered it to say when he was seven, one, one, two, three, four, five, etc. One and ten, eleven. Two and nine, eleven. Three and eight, eleven. How many times eleven? Five times eleven. So the rule is n times n minus one divided by two. Then you get the n squared. So that is the number of possible states associated with that single n given. That is energy given, n is given. How many states? That many states. This is when no spin. In include the spin. You see, we have to include the spin for other reasons. I'm going to enjoy, and I'm sure together with you, we are going to enjoy this a lot. So include the spin, then how many, what is the number of degeneracy? Two coming from the spin part, n squared is already found from the orbital part. What is this two? Well, let's try to no normal size so that it doesn't look strange. So this two is, 2s plus 1, right? When s is 1 half, and it becomes that. So this is now, with the spin, 2n squared is the degeneracy. Again, going back to the hydrogen now. Without the spin, the only non-degenerate one is the ground state, n equals 1, because when n equals 1, l equals 0, and m equals 0, so thus, for the ground state, for Okay, let me open up a new page. So ground state. N equals one, the lowest energy state. N can take only, the minimum of N is one. It cannot have zero, right? If it's zero, it blows up. So if N equals one, L is from, goes from 0 to n minus 1, that's 0, and thus m is 0. So what is the now uh, ground state, uh, eigenstate? Psi 1, 0, 0, or theta pi. That is what? That's a 0. So r, 1, 0, r, and y, 0, 0, theta phi. that's a constant obvious, right? Remembering the properties of the spherical harmonics. 
that's a constant. So ground state is just a simple function of R. As a matter of fact, it's e to the minus R over A0, the Bohr radius, right? So we sort of have a feeling about it. But when you, once you go to n equals 2, already f f there is a four tuple degeneracy, and there's angular dependent parts also coming in. Or when you go n equals 3, that's nine tuple degeneracy. So life becomes quite already at the level of first excited level, n equals 2, even with no spin. There is a four tuple degeneracy, there is a four dimensional degeneracy subspace, and whatever perturbation term that you construct, you have to find the eigenvalues of that perturbation in a four dimensional subspace. Finding energy eigenvalues, some of you who have been involved with the numerical analysis should know that it's a difficult problem, symbolically particularly. Because finding an energy eigenvalue problem is equivalent to diagonalizing a matrix or solving an algebraic equation of fourth degree. Or in the second excited state, which is nine dimensional, you have to solve an algebraic equation of ninth degree. Nobody knows how to do them symbolically. You can only do that numerically. So it's a difficult problem. That's, so as it is a difficult problem, th there is a catch in this type of problems. You have to find a basis among the possible bases of the H0, which automatically diagonalizes the perturbation terms that you have found or given to you. If those are already diagonal in the one of the possible bases of the H0, then you are lucky. Or else the smallest dimension that you face is 4 with no spin, together with spin 8 dimensional, so 8 degree algebraic equation are to be solved. Nobody knows how to do that. So this is the sort of background of this problem. So what is our next task? Our next task is to, within the non-relativistic regime, to sort of construct the possible corrections which we have to add to H0 to make it more realistic. In the first place, why need corrections to make it more realistic? Why? need corrections to H0. Let's pose that question and let's uh, find a rationale for this correction first. The rationale is the following. You know, we have been treating this fully non-relativistically as if we are in the Newtonian Galilean regime. Well, of course, if you are dealing with speeds at the order of 1,000 kilometer per hour at most, or perhaps a couple of 2,000 kilometers per hour at most, you don't have to do anything. You, you just use the non-relativistic physics, whether Newtonian in classical or Schrodinger in quantum, it's all the same. But let's first of all see what kind of speeds at the average level we are dealing with when we are in an atom. Okay, here is the zero, and that is the C, that's the velocity axis. And we all know that in the theory of relativity, our range of speeds are not infinite. The lowest value is zero, the maximum value is the famous speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second, very high. If you want to convert it into kilometer per hour, you have to multiply it by 3,600, which makes it already one million, right? At the order of one million kilometers per hour. It's a very high speed. But of course, that's the extreme limit here. Where do we stand in here in the atomic physics in this scale? Are we somewhere here? Let's see. We are not very close to the Newtonian Belt, right? This is Newtonian Galileo belt, say 1,000 or 3,000 kilometers per hour. It's very small in here. We are talking about 1 million kilometers per hour. Therefore, 
that's Newtonian case, that's pure Einsteinian regime, and we are somewhere in between. Let's estimate that. This is an estimate, it's an estimate, therefore we can afford to be sloppy. What is the average speed in, in, in an atom? We know that they are not following trajectories, but we can estimate the average, right? Let me use this childish argument. Say that this is the average speed squared, one half, the kinetic energy. And what is, the, what is this equal to? I get something from the quantum mechanics in here. Say, so let's take the most quantum of it. Most quantum is n equals 1, right? So this is about alpha squared over 2 me, well, that's the me as well, electron, me squared. You may say this is a bit brute force, but we are estimating, we're giving order of magnitude estimation. So what do I do? Well, halves cancel, and uh, let me modify this a little bit. Write it as mc squared times v over c squared, for obvious reasons. And then you see you have mc squared appearing in both sides. Cancel them. So what is, uh, what, what is left over? Uh, through this simplest argument that you can ever cook up, right? It's uh, childishly simple. So what you have from here is v over c is at the order of alpha. You are going to see that eventually when we go into more sophisticated type of physics. This beautiful argument is going to play such an important role. What is V over C? It's the relative speed, right? Usually we denote it by beta. It is purely from relativity. It tells you how fast you are moving. Beta is a measure of how close you are to the Einsteinian or Newtonian regime, depending on its value, zero to one. The smallest value of beta is zero, and the upper, upper, upper value is one. And there is a very quantum constant, a relativistic constant, and quantum constant is associated. They're sort of made, put in the same box, sort of. One is quantumness, one is relativityness. And they, for the atomic physics, they match. So here, the beta, or V in here is alpha times C. Well, that's not a small number, by the way, already. Let's estimate that. So let's do a thumb rule computation to see how small or large that is. So alpha is 1 over 137, and this is 300 thousand kilometers per second, per hour, therefore per second, it is this figure, right? So this and that gives you approximately, so let me do this, put z ten to the four, so this one is three times ten to the six, so 3 times 0.36 divided by 137 times 1, 2, 6, and four, 10. 10. 1 million. No, of course, I have to divide this by. Uh, 1 million, 100,000, and 10,000. At the order of 8,000 about 8,000 to 10,000 approximately, 8,000 kilometer per second. And per hour. Bir dakika çocuklar, bu elinizde kalkülatör olan var mı? Ben niye tahtada bunu yapmayı deniyorum ya? Please, okay. Okay, forget it. Just do it quickly. Compute the speed of light first by multiplying it with 3,600 and then divide it by 137. Telefon alın abi. 
Bunun üzeri altı. Okay, so it's it is a very large number, right? Very large as compared to the daily speeds that you are used to, include the space shuttle even, you know, that's very fast. But it is a very big speed that the effects of it is to be taken into account. Therefore, obviously, this H0, the Coulomb Hamiltonian, is not a good tool to describe a realistic, a physical hydrogen atom. So we have to bring in the effects from the relativity. That's the most important thing. We have to bring in some corrections associated with the semi-relativistic speeds. So, that is the physical argument. So what do I mean by that, first of all? Well, the first thing, meaning is that we have to need correct the kinetic energy. First. What do I mean? Well, we use the Newtonian kinetic energy, right? Obviously, we should not use that. Or at least we have to find corrections to this order. If beta is at the order of alpha, so we have to include the corrections coming from, from the correct relativistic energy to this one. What is the correct relativistic kinetic energy? It is c squared p squared plus m squared c to the 4 minus the rest mass energy, right? That should be the one which we have to consider. But to what level? Well, this is the exact kinetic energy expression in the relativistic case. But obviously, it is not, we are not that close to the limit of the Einsteinian limit, therefore, we have to use an approximation of it which will explain the corrections coming from that region. How do we work that out? Let's focus in this term. Let's, in order to be able to make a rational comparison, then I have to write it in a slightly different form. Well, that form is the following. Let me write it as follows. Let me take the mc squared term out of the square root. What is left over inside? It is 1 plus p squared divided by m squared c squared. And of course these are in the under the square root sign. That is the expression inside. Well, the presence of mc squared is a reflection of the relativistic nature of this. But let me try to rewrite this in a slightly more recognizable form. Let me divide the numerator and denominator both by 2m. Therefore, this numerator becomes p squared over 2m. And denominator becomes 1 half of mc squared. Or let, for aesthetic reasons, let's write it mc squared over 2. Well, the point in this way of rewriting it is that you have a one, a dimensionless number, plus another number which is dimensionless because it's energy divided by energy. So I can estimate how large or how small that is. What is the typical average p squared over 2m in an atom? Well, we know that atom has this quantized energies and the magnitude-wise, the largest value is 13.6 electron volts. That's the ground state. It's minimum, of course, as it has negative energy, but the magnitude, absolute value, is 13.6 electron volts. So, using the virial theorem, if you remember from your previous courses, we know that the average value of the kinetic energy, potential energy, and total energy are all the same order of magnitude up to factors of two or one half. So, this is at the order of 10 electron volts. What is the order of this? 
Well, rest mass energy of the electron is half a million electron volts. And half of it is about 250,000 electron volts. So you're really taking, considering a ratio of 10 divided by 250,000, so it is 1 over 25,000. So it is 10 to the minus 5. So this is order of 10 to the minus 5 to the 4. A very small number. Small but still needs to be included because there is an overall large thing multiplying in front. So because of that. So what do I do? I use the binomial expansion, right? The typical binomial expansion I'm going to use in here is of the, of the following form. Epsilon I use as a notation to indicate that it's a small number. And alpha is a fraction. It could be even a fraction. So how does it go? It goes like 1 plus alpha times epsilon plus alpha times alpha minus 1 divided by 2 factorial epsilon squared, etc. It goes all the way, right? It's an infinite series in principle. So for our purposes, alpha is 1 half, because that's the square root I'm dealing with. So this becomes 1 plus epsilon over 2 <coughs> plus 1 half minus a half makes it minus a quarter divided by 2 minus 1 over 8 epsilon squared. So that is, is, I guess that's a sufficient precision that we shouldn't pursue our expansion any further beyond. So then I can write this, this kinetic energy expression by calling now this as the epsilon. That's my epsilon. So what do I have? mc squared. 1 epsilon over 2 minus 1 over 8 epsilon squared plus minus minus mc squared because that's the total free, the relativistic energy minus the rest mass energy makes it a relativistic kinetic energy. So obviously the, the term makes it mc squared which cancels against that. What is left over is that's an approximation, so let's put the approximate sign. It's not an exact expression because we have stopped at the second order. So what do I have then? One half mc squared times epsilon. Let's put that thing back at p squared over 2m or even, even simplified version p squared divided by m squared c squared. That's that. Minus 1 over 8 p squared squared divided by m to the 4 c to the 4 times an overall mc squared in the front. So that is the expression. What is this? m's cancel, c squared cancel, and this one is 1 half or aesthetically more appealing, p squared over 2m is the leading term. Oh, nice. We have recovered the Newtonian term, right? It should be, because if, uh, in the proper regime, relativist, Einstein relativity should agree with the Newtonian re or Galilean relativity, to be more fair. And what is the second term, which is the new one? p squared squared divided by 8 m cubed c squared, of course, that is the order we are stopping. We are not pursuing our expansion any further beyond that point. So we have really discovered the relativistic correction to the kinetic energy. So let's underline, encircle it using a different color. That's the relativistic, cor relativistic correction to the kinetic energy. Obviously, that is to be added. That's one of the terms which I have to add to H0. We will. We will give it a name. We will call it H1 just to make it more systematic, to keep track of it. So the new 
term that I have to add to H0, let's call it delta H1, is minus P squared squared divided by 8 M cubed C squared. Okay. But we cannot stop in here, right? Once we have discovered that the electron inside the atom is making some sort of relativistic motion, although modestly relativistic, and we should say whether that has another uh, correction, whether that may lead to another correction in a slightly different context. What context I'm talking about? I'm talking about the spin. Could spin be brought in or should be brought in? Could or should spin be included because of the relativity only? So it's an important question. Well, perhaps, yes. And now, as we will illustrate, that's going to lead to the spin orbit problem. Let's try to motivate ourselves. As we are in the relativity, then, of course, the, there is new avenues opening in front of us. We have to, first of all, compare the physics as, as seen from the perspective of the nucleus. Here there is a small but very massive nucleus, right? Proton, even a single particle. It is 2,000 times heavier than the electron. Electron is half a million electron volt. Proton is 940, 938 to be precise, million electron volt. When you take the ratio, it's about 2,000 times heavier. Therefore, in the Schrodinger formulation, we just, instead of going through that stupid trouble of computing the effective mass of a two-body problem, we treat the nucleus infinitely heavy, so it's at rest, and the electron with this, this tiny mass moving in the Coulomb field of that heavy, quote-unquote, infinitely heavy nucleus. So there's a frame associated with this, which we take to be the at rest. Well, here is the cloud of the electron far away. The size is five order of magnitude as compared to the tiny size. It's concentrated on a, like a pinhole, right? But, now suppose we look at the problem, try to look at the problem from the perspective of the rest frame of this electron instantaneously at rest somewhere, right? right? So in that respect, K prime is the rest frame of the electron. Okay. K is the rest frame of the proton, which is taken to be infinitely heavy. I think there is a problem of visibility because of that other chalk. This is the K prime frame. If we were, well, first of all, in the K frame, we have what the Coulomb, Coulomb field of the nucleus. And, but there is no magnetic field because we take the proton, it's the rest frame of the proton, proton is at rest, it, can, it just creates a static electric field. There is nothing else. Fine. But when we go to the K prime frame, it's a moving frame. Rest. K prime frame is moving So what, you say? Well, so what is the following? If it is a moving frame, when you transform quantities from one frame to the other, of course, there are new components 
there are new components which emerge. If it is, if the things under consideration is a four vector like the position and the momentum and other type of stuff. So when you go from this frame to the other, and of course there is a, a standard transformation property, which is called Lorentz transformation, which connects these two frames vis-a-vis -vis the four vectors. Question, what kind of mathematical entities these electric and magnetic fields are? Well, in the e, e non-relativistic regime, we denote one of them as a three vector, the other is also three vector. So if you follow simple logic, when you go from a, a three-dimensional space to a four-dimensional space, they should be elevated to four vectors, as is the case of the position and the momentum, right? You have three-dimensional position vector in the three-dimensional space, Galilean space. When you go to four-dimensional Lorentz space, they became, become x mu or p mu, etc. But that logic doesn't go through. You have to really understand the very nature of, the very, very mathematical nature of electric and magnetic fields. They are not three vectors in the three-dimensional space. Although you think they behave like three vectors, they are really t have a tensorial character. So E and B are components of an anti-symmetric second rank tensor, anti-symmetric second rank. Tensor. Uh -huh. If that is the case, of course, we have to be very careful about the transformations. They don't follow the same path. As far as the Lorentz transformations are concerned, we have to do something else. So what is that tensor in the first place? Let's work it out. That is d mu a nu, d nu a mu, and a mu is the four potential, which is composed of the scalar potential and vector potential. So this is the one which forms a four vector, but there is another tensor associated with this f mu nu, which involves derivatives, obviously. They should be the ones which are associated with the E and B, electric and magnetic fields. For instance, you can work out the F0i component, which is D0ai minus Dia0. Then you see that electric and magnetic field type of things are making its emergence. What is it then? Dai dx0 minus dA0 dxi. Well, I had invited already you all of you last week to make some study on the theory of relativity this weekend. So I have started working using the four vector notation. Notice that this was a super index there and that corresponds to this lower index. Therefore, if you would like to really remember the definition of the four vector, which is x0 identified with the c times the t, and the Cartesian three vector. All the vectors in the three dimensional space is Cartesian, therefore that's the association. We put this three space vector in here as in the Cartesian form, complement it at the zeroth component with the t to make the dimension fully dimensionally consistent. We multiply it with a c. That is the four vector which is called contravariant vector. And you can also work out the con covariant covariant one, which will be obtained by the multiplication of this metric, therefore it will be, it is not going to affect the zeroth component, and it's the minus the Cartesian component. Now you see that this one, well for the gradient it's the opposite, therefore d mu is d dx mu, that's the ordinary four dimensional gradient, which is d dx0 
and the ordinary Cartesian gradient operator, which is, this is again the minus, therefore I can write it as dA0 dxi plus dAi 1 over c dt, then you recognize this quantity F0 i becomes minus the electric field. So how beautifully we have reproduced the electric field with the correct sign. Because the electric field, remember, is minus the gradient in the Cartesian notation, minus the gradient of the scalar potential, minus 1 over C dA vector divided by dt. Therefore, F super zero i is associated with the I don't write it equal because that's the i-th index. Please be careful in the indices. Minus the electric field. And you can work out similarly the Fij, which will come out to be the del cross A, which is the conventional, right? So that's a good point to stop. We will continue after a short break.